story of a ship. A ship that survived the worst flood in history. The largest ship built for more than 5,000 years. The Ark of Noah. The basic story is the same in the history of every nation, every race, in all parts of the world. Mankind had become violent, evil, and corrupt. And God decided to send a flood to destroy every living thing in the world. Everything except two of every kind of the animals, one man, his wife, and family. We know that man best as Noah. God spoke to Noah and told him to build a giant ship three stories high, to cover the wooden timbers with pitch or tar inside and out. This is the Queen Mary in Long Beach Harbor, California. Completed in 1936, it's 1,019 feet long. Noah's Ark is approximately one half as big as the Queen Mary. The Ark was to be 300 cubits long, which would make the length of the ship 450 to 500 feet. It was approximately 75 feet wide and 45 feet high, with a window in front and a huge door in the side. No ship would be built larger than the Ark until the year 1857, when the Great Eastern was launched in England. The capacity of the Ark made it possible for it to carry more cargo than 522 railway freight cars. Modern cargo ships are still constructed in the design ratio of the Ark. It's been found to be the most stable of all maritime designs. Its design also makes it extremely practical for cargo. And Noah had an enormous cargo. Other than himself and his wife, his three sons and their wives, the Ark was to carry an estimated 35,000 animals, male and female, of all the kinds of animals. Noah was king in the ancient city of Sherapak in what now is Iraq. So King Noah, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and his subjects, built the ark. The Bible says it took Noah 120 years. High and dry from the nearest body of water big enough to float it, the ark was finally completed. The animals went aboard two by two as God had commanded. And Noah and his passengers and cargo were all shot up in the ark to await the flood God had promised. Noah had warned the people of Sherapak for 120 years of the coming flood. But no one listened. They ignored him, laughed at him, and watched in ridicule and scorn for more than a century as King Noah built this monstrosity of a ship. He and his small family waited, shut up in the ark, shut out from a laughing world. For seven days and seven nights they waited, but there was no sign of the coming flood. Then God's promised cataclysm began. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, were all the windows of heaven opened up. And on that same day were all the fountains of the deep broken up. Scientists have now confirmed that at this time there was a tremendous cataclysm that inundated Noah's world, if not the entire earth. One theory is that a canopy of vapor had surrounded the earth up until the time of the flood. That the earth was a giant hothouse with lush plant life and an even tropical temperature. And that all the water at that time came out of the ground from springs or condensed overnight in the form of dew. It's thought that the canopy of vapor was broken apart during the cataclysm and that rain came from the skies for the first time. If this is true, then Noah and the people of Sherapak saw the first rain fall on Earth.
Genesis in the Bible says that it rained 40 days and 40 nights, that the floodwaters continued to rise for 110 days after the rain stopped. Flood deposits have been found by archaeologists in Iraq that range from 5 to 12 feet thick. Entire civilizations buried under mud and debris. In 1931, the University of Pennsylvania uncovered flood deposits in Sherapak, where Noah was king. Conclusive proof that the entire city was destroyed by a giant flood some 5,000 years ago. What must the people of Sherapak have thought? when rain began to fall out of the sky for the first time. Did any of them remember Noah's warning when the thunder and lightning surrounded them and the rising waters forced them from their homes? 150 years after the flood, Noah told a watching from the window of the ark as God wept. How the earth shuddered and was torn apart as God's tears collected and flooded the earth. King Noah told of watching from the ark as the dead men of Sherapak floated by like dead logs as the ark shuddered and trembled under the eruptions of the earth just before the light turned to darkness. survivors sent out a bird to see if the land were dry enough to disembark. When the bird didn't return, Noah and his family let the animals out and built an altar to praise the God who had spared their lives. And according to the Bible, God put a rainbow in the skies as a sign to Noah that he would never again destroy everything from off the earth by flood. Mount Ararat is located in the most remote region of eastern Turkey. This is where Noah landed after a journey of more than a year and some 500 miles from his kingdom in southern Iraq. The mountain was once in ancient Armenia, and all history can be traced back to its surrounding foothills. The names of the villages around the mountain still mark the importance of the events that took place there as Noah and his family and the animals came out of the ark and made their way off the mountain. 26 miles southeast of Mount Ararat lies the Russian village of Nakichevan. Its ancient name was Noxana, which translates as place of descent. 
This is the traditional first landing place of Noah and his family after they came down from the ark. For thousands of years, the villagers here have pointed out a tomb, which they say to be the tomb of Noah. The Araxes River marks the present boundary between Turkey and Russia. Translated, Araxes River means River of the Ark. Across the river lies the village of Marand. Its translation means the mother is here. And it's said that here is where Noah's wife died and was buried shortly after the flood. At the foot of the mountain on the north side lies the village of Ahura. The translation means, here he planted the vine. For thousands of years a vineyard here was said to have been planted by Noah with vines he brought with him from the ark. The last vine from the original vineyard was said to still be bearing fruit when it was destroyed in an earthquake in 1828. Noah built a home and for hundreds of years led the pilgrimages back up to the mountain to worship his God. The village of Koran translates as village of Noah. As the years passed and his sons' families grew, the migration began. From the village of Otolu on Mount Ararat's south side, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their families went their separate ways out into the world. Otolu translated means place of dispersal. The headwaters of the Euphrates River are at the very foot of Mount Ararat. Underground water deep within the mountain seeps its way down into the earth and comes up in the marsh below. As the waters of the marsh collect and drain, the river begins its 1,700-mile journey to the Persian Gulf. It's thought that Shem and Ham's families migrated down the Euphrates, where Noah's grandson, Nimrod, founded the mightiest city in ancient times, Babylon. Back down the great river to within 100 miles from where their journey had begun. All history can be traced back to the foot of Mount Ararat, along the banks of the Euphrates. Historians have called this area the Fertile Crescent. Two major civilizations developed here, the Mesopotamians and Sumerians. The Sumerians in the south developed the earliest known form of the written language, the cuneiform inscription. South of Babylon, in the first kingdom of Erech, after the flood, there lived a mighty warrior king named Gilgamesh. This tablet was found in Iraq by a British museum expedition. It tells the story of the flood as told to King Gilgamesh. This account was written nearly 4,600 years ago. King Gilgamesh went back to visit the survivor of the flood who was still alive and living at the foot of a great mountain at the headwaters of a mighty river. Gilgamesh had made the long journey back to the foot of the mountain to find the secret of immortality from the immortal man who had survived the flood. In this tablet, his name was not Noah, but Adnapishtim. Gilgamesh was king in Arach approximately 150 years after the flood. In the book of Genesis, Noah was said to have lived 350 years after the flood. This tablet was found in the library of King Ashurbanipal, uncovered in 1872 in Nineveh, Iraq, again for the British Museum. It tells a similar story of the flood, except the immortal man was not Noah, but Zesustros. And this tablet was recently found in the basement of the British Museum and is filmed here for the first time. It also tells the same story of the flood, except Noah's name is changed to Astrahasis.
All these cuneiform tablets range in age from 4000 to 650 BC. They all tell the story of the cataclysmic flood that destroyed all the world, everything except one man, his wife and family, and two each of all the kinds of animals. Whatever his name was, Adnapushtam, Zesustros, Astrahasis, or Noah, early man evidently felt obligated to record for posterity the flood story. The tablets from Samaria, the book of Genesis from the Bible, the legends from the four corners of the world, all say the ship landed on the top of a great mountain. Many of the legends fixed the number of survivors of the flood at eight. The number eight is held in almost mystical reverence by most religions of Asia. The ancient name for the area around Mount Ararat was Terra Themenin. The Armenian translation of Terra Themenin is region of the eight. And of Armenia, there has never been a time when it was not known that Noah's Ark was on Mount Ararat. The history of the pilgrimages to worship at the original altar built by Noah are still a very real part of every Armenian church in the world. Stone steps were built up the mountain and the more difficult cliffs to make the climb easier for the worshipers to return to the ark to worship Noah's God. In 300 BC, the Babylonian priest Barossus wrote that the inhabitants of the area still climbed the mountain and scraped tar from the timbers of the ark, which they wore as talismans around their necks. He also wrote, the timbers of which are still preserved there. In 150 AD, Flavius Josephus, the Jewish historian, also recorded that the ark was still visible on Mount Ararat in Armenia and told of visits of others who had seen the vessel. Armenian history records an army from the east in the year 400, conquered the area and was making its way up the mountain to destroy the ark. When a mighty earthquake shook the mountain apart and a terrible storm destroyed the stone steps, killed the invading army and froze the ark in ice and snow. Since that time, the exact location was lost. The inhabitants lived in deathly fear of the mountain. It was their holy mountain, protected from all harm by God. They still believe there is a magic zone up on the mountain, past which no man can survive. Two nations shared the area around Mount Ararat for centuries. The Armenians, who were killed by the millions in the Turkish-Russian wars of the 1920s, and the nomadic Kurds. Life has changed little for the Kurds of eastern Turkey. The Kurds have survived for centuries on the barest essentials. Superstitious, violent, dangerous, the Kurds still rob and plunder throughout Asia and the Middle East. Armed mounted bandits still roam at will across the boundaries of Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and even the Soviet Union. Smuggling and sheep are the Kurds' chief means of livelihood. For countless centuries, Kurdish fathers told their sons, and the sons told their sons, that Noah's Ark was on their mountain. Until very recently, no Kurd believed that man could survive the climb to the top of Mount Ararat. As time went on and the glacier came to freeze the ark, the younger generations forgot the exact location. Armies came and went. Wars came and went. Time and history passed this tiny corner of the world by.
Alexander the Great fought and defeated the great Persian army in the hills just west of the mountain. The great Carthaginian general Hannibal met his defeat in this mountain pass. Mount Ararat and the area of the Eight found themselves in the main invasion route of passing armies. Pompey conquered Armenia for Rome in 62 BC. For centuries, the area was controlled from this fort. This strategic military area changed hands a dozen times in as many centuries. War was a way of life in these mountains. Anthony and Cleopatra planned the campaign that defeated the Armenian king once again here in 34 BC. Six Roman legions were quartered here in 81 AD to protect the eastern frontier of the empire. In the year 600, the East Roman Emperor Heraclius wrote of going from here to the village of Thamenin and from there to the location of the Ark. In 649, the Muslim armies swarmed over the fort and drove the Romans out forever. The Christian chapel of the Romans was replaced by the Islamic mosque, and a Kurdish king commanded the kingdom in Muhammad's name. And even though Muhammad had written in the Quran that the Ark landed on another mountain 200 miles away, the Kurds held on to the belief that the Ark was on their mountain. Mohammed was never wrong to the Kurds, except about where the Ark landed. Near the year 1000, a monk named Jacob ended his search for the Ark. After his lifelong quest, he came down from the mountain with timber from it. This well is said to be one of the miracles of St. Jacob by the Kurdish people. On one of his journeys to find the ark, Jacob dug his foot into the ground and up bubbled this freshwater spring, the only spring on Mount Ararat. Visitors still tie bits of their clothing to the tree beside the well to ensure that their wishes and dreams come true. St. Jacob was buried under this simple pile of stones on the side of the mountain. A holy man of the Kurds on the mountain who climbed it and found the ark and brought back timber from it. In the year 1186, Kurdish king Ishak Pasa ruled with an iron hand in eastern Armenia. He abandoned the old Roman fort across the valley and started building a new castle. Ishak Pasa wanted to rival the splendor of the sultans in the west, who lived in absolute luxury. It took 52,000 men, 30 years, to build this monument of power. Dogobayas, it, it was called. Kingdom of the East. Ordinarily, we would never know the story of this obscure kingdom on the eastern edge of Turkey. But near the year 1250, King Ishak Pasa had a very special guest. Marco Polo, the famed Italian traveler and writer, stopped here on his way to India. The king told Marco Polo of his several expeditions to the mountain to try to find the location of the Ark, but was turned back each time by the freezing cold and avalanches. Marco Polo wrote in his diary of the giant vessel being stranded on Mount Ararat near the summit and said, it's impossible to reach due to the everlasting snow and ice. of June 1840. As shepherds carefully guided their flocks on the steep slopes of the north side of the mountain, a giant ear-splitting rumble was heard. And within seconds, Mount Ararat was virtually torn in half. 
Seven and one half cubic miles of the mountain came crashing down into the foothills below, destroying everything in its path. St. Jacob's Monastery at the foot of the mountain was destroyed in the wink of an eye. Further down, the entire village of Ahura was inundated by billions of tons of crushing lava rock from the mountain. More than 2,000 were killed that night in the village. The earthquakes and rumbles went on for days. Everything was gone. The monastery, the town, the vineyard Noah was said to have planted. Buried under tons of rock from the mountain. The Turkish government sent crews of workmen to the Ohora earthquake. reaches of the gorge in an effort to find the cause of the avalanches and to erect barriers from the falling rocks and boulders. As they climbed past the gorge on the northwest side of the mountain, they saw the ark sticking out of the glacier. The first sighting in more than a thousand years. Protected by God a hundred different ways for some 5,000 years, man was once again allowed to see the ship that had salvaged all mankind from the cataclysmic flood. They reported that only three large rooms were sticking out of the ice. Their discovery was announced to the world press and was largely ignored. Turkey was a Muslim country and Mohammed said the ark was on another mountain and Mohammed was never wrong. The discovery was quietly dropped. The Turkish government would ignore the ship on the mountain for another 50 years. The Turkish government again appointed a commission to investigate avalanches on Mount Ararat in 1883. When the investigators got to the mountain, they were told that the ark had been seen continually for the previous six years by the inhabitants on the mountain. They climbed the gorge and were led to the location of the ark by their Kurdish guides. The unstable mountain was extremely dangerous. Mount Ararat is a volcano, and its fractured lava rocks and boulders rearrange themselves continually. Sulfuric gases and fumes still escape the fractures on the mountain. Turkish work crew again discovered Noah's Ark sitting at the foot of a giant glacier, its bow sticking out of the ice. They were able to explore many of the rooms and reported stalls for animals and even iron bars on some of the cages. And again the announcement went out to the world press. Noah's Ark had been discovered. And after the initial wave of press releases, the skeptical editors of the day began to ridicule the story, and the discovery became a joke to the world and an embarrassment to the Turkish government. And as they had done 50 years earlier, they quietly dropped it. No investigation, no confirming expeditions. It was simply ignored and forgotten. In 1892, at the age of 33, John Joseph, Prince of Nuri, an Archbishop of the Persian Nestorian Church, 
announced to the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago that he had successfully led an expedition to Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat. He told of his finding the Ark wedged between two outcropping of rocks at the foot of the glacier. He measured it and found the ship's length at 500 feet. snow and ice, he said he was able to explore over 300 rooms in the ship, many with iron bars on cages. His report before the world religious leaders was ridiculed and ignored. It was even stricken from the official minutes of the conference and dismissed as ridiculous. The greatest discovery in the history of the world, ignored and ridiculed. Not by Muslims this time, but by the world's Christian leaders. So the Ark of Noah was returned to its icy grave to await another time, another discovery, another generation who could accept its existence. Russia was now in control of the strategic area in Asia, where Mount Ararat had witnessed so many armies and conquerors before. In the summer of 1916, a Russian pilot named Andrei Ruskovitsky flew over the mountain on a routine test flight. As he made a pass over the mountain's northwest corner, he saw a ship sticking out of the glacier. He made his report, but his superiors laughed at him. So the next day, Ruskovitsky flew back over the mountain and took the first photograph ever of Noah's Ark. The picture and the report was sent to the Tsar himself. Tsar Nicholas II authorized the first scientific expedition ever to research the ship on the mountain. The Tsar sent 150 soldiers, scientists, photographers, and equipment to research the discovery. The Russians assaulted the site from two sides and reached the Ark in the winter of 1917. They found the ship sticking out of the glacier at the 14,000 foot elevation. Its bow and stern were sticking out of the ice. They photographed it, took samples of the timber for analysis, measured it, studied it, and sent a special courier back to the Tsar with the report. But the Russian Revolution had overthrown the Tsar. He and his family had been killed, and nothing more was ever heard from the courier or the report. Whether the new communist government destroyed the report or buried it away in the dark recesses of the Kremlin, we may never know. What we know of the discovery has been told to researchers by soldiers in that expedition who escaped to America and lived to tell their story. The pilot, Ruskovitsky, emigrated to America and wrote of his discovery in the 1920s. It made the newspapers at the time, but the world had other problems to think about. The Russian-Turkish War in 1924 destroyed millions of Armenians in the Ararat area. Entire villages of Armenians were exterminated in the bitter war with the Turks. Turkey then came into control of the area once again, and no one had the time or the inclination to think about Noah's Ark. Fifty-two French industrialist and mountain climber Fanon Navarra led a French expedition to Mount Ararat to find the Ark. Navarra had worked for more than 15 years, researching and planning his expedition. In the summer of 1974, at his home in Bordeaux, France, he told producer Bart LaRue of his nine expeditions to the mountain and his finding the location of Noah's Ark. The first time I went to the mountain was in 1952. I climbed the mountain three times that year. To get permission to go up the mountain in a restricted military zone, the Turkish government insisted that I take along 100 of their troops and train them in mountain climbing.
It was most expensive and the most difficult, but it was the only way we could get on the mountain. We first went up the south side to the summit, but dragging along a hundred soldiers was most difficult. The troops were Turkish, recruits from all over the nation. The mountain was terrible for them. Every five minutes they were stopping to rest. We were scattered all over the mountain. We wanted to cover the mountain, looking for the Ark. But with the soldiers, we could get nowhere. Alem had described the mountain to me very precisely. It was a most difficult mountain. The avalanches go on day and night. Without warning, boulders as big as bulldozers fall all around you. Every rock on the mountain is loose and uh, you continually slip and uh, slide. The Turks call the mountain Agridag the painful mountain. It is well named. The storms come up in a matter of seconds, from bright warm sunshine to freezing cold in a matter of minutes. Bears and panthers roam the mountain and are extremely dangerous for climbers. Packs of wolves howl throughout the nights as they stalk the flocks of sheep the Kurds bring to the mountain in the summers. Falling loose rock Earth tremors and quakes have shaken everything loose on the entire mountain. Under any rock could hide a poisonous snake waiting for an intruding climber. Since 1938, when I met Alem, I knew that one day it would be my destiny that I come to Mount Ararat and search for the Ark. We explored the Ahura Gorge on the north side of the mountain near the Russian border. We went from the gorge up the northwest corner. By then we were able to climb away from the soldiers who were not anxious to keep up with us. One afternoon, I had climbed above my other friends along a ridge on the south side of Parrot Glacier when I noticed this eagle circling over my head. I continued on up the lava ridge and saw shadows on the ice. I thought it was the eagle again casting its shadow below me. But as I looked, I saw the first dark shadow just underneath the ice. It looked like the outline of a giant ship. We wanted to explore it further, but the soldiers were anxious to go and our time was up on the mountain but I had already resolved to return and explore the dark shadows underneath the ice. In 1953, I went again. The mountain and the shadows had become an obsession with me. Raphael was only 11 and did not want to go and climb the mountain, but he was the oldest and the strongest, and he finally agreed to go with me. Mount Ararat can be a terribly difficult mountain. My backpack weighed 85 pounds. Raphael's inexperience was of great concern to me. I had great doubts about having brought him into such danger. on 
the northwest side of the mountain. It is the only fresh water on the mountain. After resting at the lake, we continued on due east toward the glacier. Lack of oxygen at the higher elevations makes each step one of labor. The storms come and go constantly. They make it extremely dangerous for climbers. The rocks cool and contract and split and fall rolling down the mountain, loosening others who in turn roll down the mountain. I recognized the site from 1952 and we pitched our tent right on the glacier and began exploring the crevasses. he had found something at the bottom of the crevasse that looked like wood. I climbed down into the crevasse, which was about 35 feet deep. I could see sunlight at the other end of the crevasse. I also saw parallel lines of shadows just underneath the ice on the walls of the crevasse. I scraped away some of the surface snow, then took my axe and started hacking at the ice. Six inches under the ice, I struck wood. I had found timber from Noah's Ark. Freezing cold during the night had almost frozen us to the bone. But the next morning I lowered myself into the crevasse once again and started digging. I had uncovered timber some 50 feet long. I broke off a piece and had Raphael pull it up out of the crevasse. I would estimate that at the bottom of that crevasse there was at least 50 tons of timber. Some timbers 150 feet long were just underneath the ice. This timber had been hand-toothed. It has a square corner on it 
and a joint where two pieces of wood were coupled together. The wood was too heavy to carry the way it was, so I decided to cut it into three pieces. We carried it out in our sacks and got it safely to France. lifelong dream they had come true. I had found the location of the Ark of Noah. Uh, three universities have carbon dated the timber and they have put its age at 5,000 years which I am told is approximately the time of the cutting of the timber before the flood. It has squared corners and is definitely untooled timber. It was found to be Quercus oak. This kind of oak was widely used in shipbuilding in ancient times in the Orient and Asia. In 1969, the Search Foundation team left Istanbul, Turkey to explore Mount Ararat. Along the Black Sea, the members of the team gathered to begin their journey. Fernand Navarra and his son Fernand Jr. Dr. Ralph Lenton and Hugo Neuberger of the Arctic Institute of North America. Bud Crawford and Alfred Lee from the Search Foundation. With a ton of scientific equipment and supplies, these experienced explorers composed the most qualified expedition to explore the mountain since the Russian expedition in 1916. south side, the morning of July 23rd, the team met with Kurdish porters who would take them up the mountain. Eleven burros, six horses, thirteen Kurd porters. Turkish police and Turkish army cooperated in every way, and the expedition was ready. Their climbing permit had been signed by every cabinet minister in the Turkish government. The United States government had furnished materials and supplies for the expedition also. One of the purposes of the expedition was to study the ice pack where the ark rested and devise a plan to melt the glacier to see how best to excavate the ark. the team was comfortably situated at base camp at the 12,800 foot elevation. Its location had been selected because of its safety from avalanches.
next morning before sunup, the team began its ascent to the Navarra site. where he had found timber 14 years earlier. The noticeable difference was that the crevasse had not melted as much as it had in years past. Still, every day, they would explore and probe the ice pack and search for the remains of the ark.
tried to find access to the hollowing crevasses below. site in 14 years. For Bud Crawford, it was the high point of a nine-year search. For Navarra, 
It was corroboration of the timber he had found in 1955. The drilling and other activities was stopped and all the team concentrated on digging into the ice at the channel of the melt pond on the theory that any loose timber from the ark would have been washed down in the melting glacier to the pond below. discoveries of timber would be found. The exploration had been extremely successful. What none of the searchers knew was that they would be the last expedition allowed on the mountain by the Turkish government. In 1974, Hollywood producer Bart LaRue and his cameraman Mike Simpson went to Europe to make this film. LaRue and Simpson arrived in Ankara, Turkey, the nation's capital, July 23rd. And although clearances had been made with the Turkish consulate in Los Angeles to make a film in Turkey, all of their motion picture equipment was confiscated by customs the minute they arrived. Bogged down in the endless red tape of the Turkish government, they went from office to office trying to get the government permit to make a film and to get their equipment out of customs. And after weeks of pounding on desks and threatening to make a film of Turkish red tape, President Koraturk's office bypassed all formalities and gave LaRue permission to make a tourist film. No mention was ever made of climbing Mount Ararat or making a film about Noah's Ark. After 20 days of red tape and delay, their motion picture equipment and passports were returned to them. A week's travel brought them to the Kent Hotel in Dogobayazid. Mount Ararat stood out before them in all its majesty. Its 17,000 foot peak dominating the landscape for a thousand square miles. Negotiations were begun for the horses and burros and guides for the expedition. But because they had no government permit to climb the mountain, and because the army was on alert on the Russian border due to the Cyprus war, the cost of an illegal expedition had skyrocketed. Four times the price of the 1969 expedition. There was not enough money to start the climb. LaRue called the United States to have his company send a cable of money. All his telephone calls were monitored by police. The three were under police and army surveillance day and night. They were questioned daily about their presence on the Russian border in a restricted military zone with a truck full of camera equipment during wartime. America had backed Greece in the Cyprus war and the two Americans were thought to be American spies. Chances for the expedition looked hopeless. Knowing that his phone calls were monitored by the questions the police asked, LaRue then placed calls to everyone, to Henry Kissinger, President Koraturk, General Adele, the Turkish Chief of Staff, the Head of Internal Security, Kamal Ostelik. None of the calls went through, but they were allowed to start filming the next day and were never questioned again. They filmed the historical areas around the mountain. The afternoon they filmed the headwaters of the Euphrates, they almost lost their camera car in the quicksand marsh called the Waters of Death in the Gilgamesh tablet. Mired in the liquid earth, the van with all their camera equipment was sinking. Swarms of mosquitoes hampered their work as a passing truck and a military patrol helped them rescue the van. 
then chase them out of the restricted military area. Weeks dragged by, and still the money from America didn't arrive. The filming around the mountain was completed. Over a hundred phone calls were made in an effort to trace the cable. But the priorities and confusion of the Cyprus War made it impossible for the cable to get through. LaRue, Simpson, and Sojin made many friends in Tokobaizit. When all of their money was gone, their Kurdish friends took them into their homes and not only fed them, but protected them from others who hated Americans because of the war with the Greeks. There was nothing to do but wait. and watch the mountain storms and prepare endlessly for an expedition that might never come. Turkish customs had confiscated all the mountaineering equipment and cold weather gear the group had brought. With borrowed children's sleeping bags and a cloth tent, the three were prepared and determined to make their climb. Thirty days after the cable had been sent, the money arrived. 160,000 Turkish lira, $12,000. The word spread like wildfire throughout the town. The Americans had received their money. The bills and loans were all repaid, and that night, LaRue paid the commander of a military outpost at the foot of the mountain $500 to allow the expedition to go up the mountain past his company of soldiers. Shortly after 10 p.m., August 16th, Kurdish smugglers took them out of the hotel and into the foothills of Mount Ararat. Their guide was to meet them up on the mountain the following morning. Each man there faced 10 years in a Turkish prison for taking the film crew into the restricted military zone. But everything is possible in Turkey, if the price is right. The cargo didn't matter to the smugglers, whether it was hashish, heroin, sheep, gold, or a film crew. The risk determined the price. In this case, 3,000 American dollars to hide the film crew two weeks on the mountain at the Search Foundation's base camp. All night, the crew climbed farther and farther up the mountain. In moonlight bright enough to read by, they passed the military outposts that had been paid not to see them. Groping along in the dark for hours, seven men, ten burros, six horses, and a ton of equipment and supplies. sunup, the crew was well up the mountain at the 10,000 foot elevation, well out of sight from down below. dropped to below freezing that morning with their cold weather gear still in customs in Istanbul 
they got a preview of the sub-zero temperatures that they would encounter before their expedition was over. They had been told by Navarro to watch the Kurds. When they leave the mountain, he had said, you leave the mountain. Meaning that the Kurds seem to know exactly when the summer was over and winter weather is on its way. But it was too late for that. The Kurds had left the mountain two weeks earlier and the winter storms would start any moment. And when they did, the entire expedition would have to be abandoned. didn't come to meet them. It was decided to move on to the next elevation and wait there for him. They were heading for the base camp where Search Foundation and Navarra had camped in 1969. The guide who was coming to meet them had been with that expedition and knew the location of the camp. The altitude was taking its toll on the men and animals. announced that they had arrived in base camp. Exhausted climbers checked out their equipment and even let the Kurds operate the cameras they had labored so hard to bring up the last 2,000 feet. Nothing looked the same in base camp as the films LaRue had seen of the previous expeditions. Nothing matched the map Navarra had drawn. They were in the wrong location. They were lost. When the guide didn't arrive the next morning, LaRue, Simpson, and Sojin scouted in all directions to try to find a landmark. For three days, they climbed in all directions to get their bearings on the northwest corner of the mountain. The porters kept saying to wait for the guide to come from Dogobayazid, and every day the guide failed to arrive. One of the porters was sent back down the mountain to find the guide and bring him back. Meantime, they continued to try to find the 1969 base camp. On the third day of scouting, LaRue found a landmark he recognized from the photographs of the previous expeditions. A crescent-shaped melt in the ice cap. He also recognized the avalanche zone on Navarra's map. south and a thousand feet too high on the mountain. A disastrous mistake by the porters. The entire camp would have to be moved. It was too far to reach the Navarra site each day. The next morning, the guide still hadn't arrived. Neither had the porter who had been sent after him. A new storm moved across the camp. And every day the weather got worse and worse. 
dark sleet and snow and freezing rain every night, it was clear the winter storms were on their way. decided to climb up to the ridge below the crescent melt and establish a new base camp. the storm went cleared enough to start the climb to the 16,000 foot elevation. surrounded them with freezing sleet and snow. The crescent melt was almost unrecognizable from the day before as the melt water froze into massive icicles. Simpson climbed out onto the glacier to try to film the crevasses. Some were estimated at near a hundred feet deep. They were turned back when an icy crust began to form over the crevasses. shelter in a small cave-like rock formation and waited to see if the storm would pass. A half hour later, the storm had stopped. The glacier and ice caps stood out before them. Startlingly spectacular. The wall of ice 200 to 300 feet high, over a cliff a thousand feet deep. Parrot Glacier spread out at their feet. They filmed the glacier and the panorama of the Navarra site from above for the first time.
Here, they would establish their new base camp. An attempt to photograph down through the ice with experimental film given them by Eastman Labs of Rochester, New York. just before sunset and made plans to move the camp the following morning. Everything would have to be taken another 2,000 feet up the mountain. The porter came into camp from Dogobiasit with a letter from the guide. The film crew had to get off the mountain. The letter said a general from Ankara is bringing a company of soldiers up the mountain the next morning with a warrant for LaRue's arrest as an American spy. The guide said he had been put in jail and questioned for four days about the film crew's plans. He had sent instructions for the porters to take them down to meet a truck which would take them out of Turkey. The camp and all of the equipment had to be taken down on foot to the 12,000 foot elevation where the horses were waiting. Trip after trip was made back up to the camp to get all of the camera equipment down. the men climbed down. Exhausted from their climb to the ice cap that day, they continued down to near the 11,000 foot elevation on the Russian side of the mountain. of rocks well out of sight from above or below. Over a breakfast of water buffalo cheese and sheep yogurt, they discussed the instructions from the guide. They were to stay hidden in the rocks until noon that day, when the soldiers would be well up on the mountain on the other side. Then even if they were seen, the soldiers wouldn't be able to get down fast enough to arrest them. All morning they watched for signs of the soldiers above them on the mountain. A new storm started its way up on the mountain between them and where they hoped the soldiers would be. They watched the storm grow and spread out over the mountain. It changed course and started directly toward them. The icy wind brought a warning that it would soon be upon them. They broke camp and started down the mountain. But within a half hour, they found themselves at an impasse in the boulders. None of the horses could get across the massive boulders. The storm was getting closer as they looked for a path out of the rocks. of rocks was laid by the porters to give the horses a foothold. sleet and snow, 
they got all of the animals and equipment across. The storm and the boulders had taken its toll on the men and the equipment. Some of the loaded burros had to be carried across the boulders. Soaked to the skin by the freezing rain and sleet, the crew changed to dry clothes as the porters repacked the loose equipment on the burros. They had three hours to cross the plain stretched out before them at the foot of the mountain. At sundown, they would meet the truck, which would smuggle them out of Turkey. Just before dark, they reached the meeting place and hid in the rocks as a new storm started across the plains and up the mountain. The expedition was over. Sixty days of frustration and trouble had come to an end. The guide told them LaRue's passport number had been posted at all the border stations. The smugglers would take them out of the country. A week later, LaRue and Simpson would be home safely in America, and Wolf would be home in Germany. None of them would ever be able to return to Turkey again, not as long as the warrants were out for their arrest. They had accomplished only part of their purpose. They had filmed the history around the mountain, filmed the panorama of the Navarra site, and it documented the conditions within the Turkish government that make it impossible for serious archaeologists to explore the site where timber from the Ark of Noah has been found. No permit has been issued by the Turkish government since 1969. No reason is ever given, no explanation. Each request is simply turned down. So it remains. Noah's Ark, half as big as the Queen Mary, lies frozen in a glacier at the 14,000 foot elevation on Mount Ararat in eastern Turkey, where it's likely to remain forever, or until the Turkish government allows the rest of the world to share in the excavation of this most priceless and important discovery, possibly the most important discovery in the history of the world.